You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And Jared Mounts. Thomas, we've got uh, two guys in with us today that uh, recently, uh, here last couple weeks, uh, won a tournament on the river, Potomac River, out of Brunswick, uh, less than ideal conditions, but had brought over 20 pounds, over 20 pounds, the way in to win that tournament. We got Rocky Groenberg and Chris Keen uh, with us here today, and uh, very glad that they agreed to come in and kind of talk to us about uh, about their tournament, and then each of them has experience, uh, we say fishing DMV, uh, a lot of different places and areas, we'll kind of get into that as well. So uh, guys, welcome, and maybe just Tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, um, thank you. You want to go first? Uh, yeah. Sure. We're going to start off with that. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> uh, um, I, I grew up doing a lot of pond fishing, bass fishing, um, creek fishing for small amounts, weighted monocacy and stuff like that. Um, I didn't grow up around jet boats or river fishing on the Potomac or Susquehanna or anything. Um, I met Rocky at work. We worked together. Um, for some reason, as a kid, I always had a, a thing, I always wanted to catch a walleye, you know, walleye, walleye, walleye yeah. fish. So I talked him into taking me walleye fishing one day, and uh, we weren't doing too well. And, and Rocky being a big musky fisherman and stuff, so he decided to switch gears, and they had three casts later, I've been hooked ever since. That's uh, awesome. And then that's, like I said, how he got me into the river fishing, the whole jet boat thing, and I just fell in love, you know, just watching him run a boat. You know, we knew even in and out of the rocks and stuff. And it was like, I had to have one. So it wasn't much longer after that. And I had the first step out and been all down here ever since. And uh, a new expensive hobby started. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had, to, I had to pick up more over time and then all that good stuff. So, yeah. And it's just it's how I got started. Just, you know, he's really showed me a lot. It opened my eyes up to a whole new world of fishing, you know. So. Yeah, that's cool, Chris. Before you go, Rocky, I mean, that just, that, <clears throat> makes me think too of how important it is to have mentors yeah. uh, in in fishing and to have somebody that you can that can take you out and kind of teach you and show you the ropes. And so, uh, hats off to you, Rocky, for taking one of your wing there and getting into it. Oh, <laughs> so. well, he was my partner, so it right. wasn't real hard to take one. That's good. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Rocky. Well, um, like most people in the area, um, I got my start real young. We didn't do any big vacations. And my family went on vacation with a bunch of campgrounds <laughs> to the park, horseshoe tournaments and weird drinking and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, um, catfishing at night. But, um, you know, I grew up down there camping all summer at the campgrounds. Uh, yeah. My father was never really into bass fishing much except for pond fishing, but I always had this intrigue and the feeling of wanting to be bass fishing. And I always laughed and my wife about it. But I, my dad used to go to work from the campground and let us there all day. He would get me up at 5 o'clock in the morning at 7 years old and let me go wait in the river when we got to work. That's oh, that's right. so cool. Wow. My that's kid would never you. know you do that <laughs> how that feels. That's right. <laughs> but, um, you know, then the Potomac gets some rough years as far as I understood as a kid. You know, I was under the understanding that the river was really polluted and the fish was no good to eat when we stopped camping. And, Really life went on. We just grew up in a hunting family. Chris can elaborate on. He's a big time hunter as well. Um, but um, I got really into archery at that point. All the way till I was probably nineteen, I met a friend through someone else, and um, his name was Jody. He was in a bass club, Greensboro Bass Masters, and he was told me what me to go with and join the club, and I did. And, that's where it really started pulling me back to fishing. Now. Really, archery and stuff phased out from that point on pretty quick. But um, we traveled around fishing for largemouth with Gaston, Lake Anna, Kerr Reservoir, Smith Mountain was probably my favorite one to visit. Mm-hmm. Um, I was never going to visit any of them, but got lots of some nice fish once in a while. Lower <laughs> Potomac. And then I, I got a jet boat and um, Started realizing I was going to these lakes for all weekend, hoping to catch five fish and to go down to the river and catch. It's right there. Yeah. Right. Right. And then I just gravitated towards it. I've always had an infatuation for flowing water. Mm-hmm. But um, 
Wow. Fast forward into that, and then just really got into hardcore river fishing, probably around 1999, I guess. My first jet boat was an express stick steer, and um, I basically learned how to run from Brunswick to Harpers Ferry with it. Wow. That boat took a beating. <laughs> I had one guy on call that was constant welding for me and stuff. Right? You know. We still hit stuff. <laughs> it's you you got to memorize that one. You still it's hit stuff. Yeah, you yeah, still hit stuff once in a while. Yeah. 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 You've had a few fish five variable a couple times. <laughs> so what are you running now? Is it the same boat? or? You no, know, sir. I, I upgraded last year to a Rock Group River Rocket. Oh, wow. I found a nice one. And um, wow, it's just chilling fishing for me all together. Mm -hmm. I've ran six years, like say since 99. And um, when I started guiding in PA, and most of the guys in the circle I work with for Susquehanna Small Mouth Solutions all have indoor jet boats. Mm -hmm. And man, after fishing with them and seeing what them boats would do, it would be like, yeah, I need to, I need to make this move mm -hmm. and try to find a way to make it happen. So it didn't take much convincing for his mama to let me break down and get one. I found the right one, but um, really besides that, just like spot lock and stuff to come on. Oh, no, that's banging. Yeah. Yeah. But um, sort of getting off track. No, no, no that's no, fine. No. That's what this is but, all about. Um, yeah. Tangents for hours is basically yeah. what we do. So it was probably about 2004. I was never any good at sports, never into any kind of sports, and hunting was slowly phasing out for me, so I was fishing year round. And we were trying to figure out how to catch these fish in the winter time. And, you know, we learned some wintering holes around the Brunswick area and was able to translate that, translate that into spots on the Susquehanna and started catching good fish year round. And um, I guess it was 2007, we, I started getting this idea that I wanted to try to catch a muskie out. And um, there was one fellow that was sharing a lot of information online about it at the time, and I decided I wanted to get into that. And I have another fishing partner, he was actually 79 years old, in the world. and um, he's been my mentor, really. Wow. He was the first person to take me to Susquehanna, that was in 19, April of 1999. And um, we still fish together in the day. Ball fish, and a great guy. Um, but, um, he told me one day we were setting to work. He subscribed to Muskie Hunter Magazine. This is the very first time it was ever published. So he was getting it for like 15 years before he even went fishing for a muskie. Wow. Because he reads a lot. <laughs> and he was telling me, I still remember setting there. He's like, you know, hey, Robert, sure would like to catch one of them muskies one day. <laughs> I was like, all right, man. So this summer we're going to try to catch one. That's cool. And um, I, the first trip out, we actually had a follow -up. And um, we just each had a um, Hooper Shallow Raider and a Metz Musky Marabou mm. bucktail. And um, we each had followers, and of course we locked up. We had to follow. We didn't do a proper figure eight or anything like that. And mm. It was more exciting to see the fish and even the next step. I think we were going to try to catch it. Right. But um, I think it was the second trip out, I actually caught one, a 37 inch. Wow. And um, it was probably the very next trip Gene actually caught one. True. And um, man, that's that cool. just started a oh, whole addiction. addiction. Yeah. It's like now I'm probably I got like four tackle boxes and lures hanging all crap. over my face. <laughs> yeah, I probably got my daughter's first car hanging around the house. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. So what's a musky fishery like like then and now? Like, is it going in the right direction? Do you think it's decreasing? Like the health of the population? What are you know, subjective to my experience. But um, I personally think it's going down a, a, a bit, but pressure's also up. There's a lot more people pursuing muskie now. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, my opinion is I don't think, I don't think that the bass was anything that suffered in 2015, 19, mm -hmm. blood board. seasons yeah. and stuff that went wrong. Because since that time, we've seen decreases in areas of the river, like, I fish for muskie anywhere from Harpers Ferry all the way to Pawpaw, West Virginia. I'm probably more fluidly traveled to Potomac to win than I do smallmouth. When I do smallmouth fishing, I do straight to run, but mm -hmm. this is my home area. It's where I long to be at for bass. But um, mm -hmm. there's several areas in the lower section of the river that if you can go there and catch muskie, I'm not saying they're not there. I'm just saying it's heavy. Mm -hmm. you know, 
Yeah. See, that certain areas have done better or doing better now. And I can say he's been doing a lot longer than I have. I'm nine years into it, and from when I first started, what I see, the areas have gotten better that I didn't think were great then, and other areas seem like they're struggling. So I don't know if it's just like an up and down thing, but it, it's definitely been changing. What kind of water are you looking for when you're trying to target those? The muskie? Mm-hmm. Um, it depends. It depends on the time of year, but there's a couple basic spots that I've learned. And I'm more of a history person. I'm not like the guy that sits around reading stuff. I run into a fish somewhere. It's a piece of a puzzle. I get a follow. I don't forget that. I remember that water temperature. I remember the time of year. And I know it's a piece of a puzzle. But right. Creeks, especially large tributaries. They're good places. They're going to be around there year-round, especially when the water comes up. Before the water gets warm, water temperatures come up and get warm, they're going to the creeks. And if the water temperatures get high, or the water levels get high in flood, they're going to the creeks. Or large eddies around. <coughs> um, and then would be deep holes, creeks, and um, dams. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Three major keys. Right. If you have a dam in your area and a tail race of a dam, mm-hmm. there's always musky. Mm-hmm. It's like ruling sport, um, dam five, dam four, the tail races and dam stuff. <laughs> They're key spots. The state record has been caught several times below yeah. dam five. Kind of mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Fresh water flowing through, new yeah. bait is constantly yeah. getting crushed by. It's just say it's a anything fish, you know, they small amount. So oh, I can see how you're right. The guys with the catfish trolls catch the big flatheads up there at the dams, yeah. the yeah. tail races and stuff now. Do the flatheads affect the muskie in the, the smallmouth? Like that introduction? No, it's a hot. I, I don't. Time. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Fish eat fish. Yeah, they do. I mean, it's just it's you know fish eat fish, and then you know, we introduce another predator fish into the Potomac. Mm-hmm. So I mean, obviously that is going to affect it. Are they to blame for everything? No. Right. Yeah. I mean, they feed other fish too. Dog eat dog world. Yeah. They just but the Potomac is only so big, and you keep. Adding more predator fish, you have walleye, the muskie. It's not the Susquehanna. Yeah, it's, not the Susquehanna. it's, 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 it's it, it can only hold so much, you know. Mm-hmm. And after a while, you yeah. your suckers are going to start dwindling off. The carp, uh, the bluegills, and all that. Yeah. And what else you got to eat? Mm-hmm. So they they start eating each other. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's that's very true. And that's what's the word through line we keep doing this year is like everyone keeps everyone says it the same thing, it's a little differently. It's like. There needs to be maybe a little adjustment in management, maybe some stocking program, something there just to find a good balance in the ecosystem or how we can help assist it in the right way to make sure that this is around for generations to come. Uh, you mentioned something um, earlier about uh, a man of history and going to certain places for smallmouth and muskie. Um, is the Brunswick area, is it more, is it a better area for smallmouth or is that just where you prefer? Is that where you think the bigger ones come is where Harper's Ferry meets? I don't think yeah. it's where the bigger ones are, I think it's where the bigger and longer and the better opportunities is because there's just so much structure there. There's so many rock ledges, so many islands, so many log jams, so many grass beds, few gravel flats, whatever, you know, rapids. When you get up in areas, you know, there's several fish that come all up and down the waterway, you know, 20, 21 to 22 inches. But it seems like down there, this is a pretty good chance. You know, spending time there. Catching them for a lot of fish for 20 years. I mean, he takes notes. You know, he, he, he could tell me a spot. Hey, I call it fish here this, on these same conditions, this same time of year, this same area, five, ten years ago. And we'll pull up there and bang, 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 there they are. Like he just, he's, you know, he's fished this area for so long. You know, he's, you know, that's, he can always tell you when, they, when the fish are going to be there, what time of year, in certain conditions. They get a pretty good idea of it. Well, let's, let's talk about that part because I, I grew up in Leesburg, Virginia. I used to run a tracker when, when White's Ferry was actually a thing. You could like come across and drop a boat or anything. But what's crazy is like, I don't, there's not a lot of literature on that part from the falls to Harper's Ferry. It seems like nobody yeah. knows about that area except if you know you have. Is that because, is there a lack of boat ramps? Is it a lack of tournaments? Like, why is it, I personally feel like I could be wrong. People don't talk about that. Some of them don't talk about that section. They always talk about above Harper's Ferry, up, up through Williamsport. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that were on, you know, especially in this group, like the 16, 17 boats that was there. Mm-hmm. Not everybody was there that was on that area, but um, so you think it's very intimidating, especially if you've never been on jet boat right. before. Yeah, it's it's pretty intimidating. But I don't really know why. I've never, 
I know why they did it. I mean, maybe because I just don't talk about it. I wouldn't publicly share it just because you should buy a little bit smaller, you know? It's the worst thing about a tournament, you know, the more votes you have, you know, it's just, if you surprise them, you're so big. You're going to live or die by your decisions where you go. How long have you all been doing tournaments out of that section? That area that you're um, familiar with? I guess the first tournament competition yeah. that I had was in the St. Jude tournament. Right. right there. And I believe that goes back to the you know, 2000. Oh, was wow. It was 2010 when my dad won that. But, um, you know, I guess Chris and I, we started fishing tournaments together. Well, how long after you got me into the root fish? And I fished that first St. Jude with the sand, and then after that, me and you have been right. stuck with it ever since. <laughs> Can't shake me. Well, see, that's what I think is interesting, though, too, because even right here on the sand, though, like, it's almost like it doesn't matter how much you fish it. it it's always going to replenish itself and it's always especially catching at least you're putting it back in so and then the question is how far are they going back are they going back to the original spot or whatever but anyway you look at it kind of like you've been saying is that that area that's holding fish for the reasons you mentioned there's something holding there wood shell ledge whatever and then there's food coming by there's there's deep water there's factors there that are deep in there and that water and you know, it just sounds to me like, and I think rivers cycle too. There's times there are going to have down years um, for whatever reason, but you know, it's always going to come back. Rashando right now is putting out good, good weights, um, but yet five, six years ago it wasn't. And so, to me, that's kind of a cycle thing. Um, you know, so uh, and it does get a lot of pressure, like you're saying. But if, if it's always been that way, and you're still seeing good numbers, I mean, twenty plus pounds. I mean, that's that's you know, four to five pound. Average, you know, I would have never, I would never do that in the league. It's going to be possible, mm-hmm. you know, just from my years of fishing down there. And I've always been to the Shenandoah tournaments. I know okay. the yeah. that tournament you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I remember from back in the beginning of my small amount of fishing, seriously, that, you know, 20 pounds is a realistic number. Right. You know, better have 20 pounds on the Right. Yeah, yeah, for the most part, especially in that river team and locks back mm-hmm. right then. But, um, yeah, I agree. I, I didn't see this one coming. Like, I told Chris probably two weeks before this tournament that something happened that hasn't happened in a while. There's a spot that I always know fish move to. When certain conditions, right before the spawn, they will stack up on this pea gravel flat. Mm-hmm. And this pea gravel flat has... Probably about the size of two cars. Yeah, it's not very big. in the middle yeah. of it. There's current flowing across it. And um, I guess I got the picture that and showed him. That was shocking. I went back to my photo and looked. I think the last time that this spot actually showed itself, was it 2008? Yeah, you showed it a while. It was 2008. No, my yeah. buddy Gene caught a 5.8 there. And we loaded the boat up, you know, several times that spring. Fun fish. And in fact, you know, you know, we're talking about a spring tournament. Our tournament season closes March 1st. So the only reason this is really even possible to the light like, is because of this being our tournament that it, they allow us to have. Oh, so then the reef the fish for the food stopping for yes. yeah. So you know, a few weeks before the tournament, I called him up. I was like, hey, <laughs> we're setting really good right now. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I was like, but that spot I've been showing you for a while and I keep telling you these ghost stories about, <laughs> it's back. Right? right. You know, and I told him, and he, of course he laughed about it. I know he took me serious, but he's like, yeah, okay, you know. And, and, we, and I did. I stayed away from it. We didn't go back. I was going down there pre-fishing a little bit for fun. I had a couple guide trips, but I didn't go near it. And um, so come the, the day of the tournament, you know, we rolled in there and probably a lot of people would be, probably be pretty shocked right now. Probably about 40 minutes into the tournament, we were already setting on 16, 17 Holy pounds. Smokes. Wow. We threw a 19, a 20 incher, a 21, almost almost 21. It back was like to back, back to back to back, the first four fish. So are you saying it hasn't set up since that long ago? Like even fun fishing going down there, it just yeah. hasn't really produced mm. like it is Not now. like this. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. So yeah. then let, let, let's let's walk through it. So the week beforehand, are you guys pre-fishing at all for this thing? Are you like, what, well, what's I going mean, on? I mean, I call it pre-fishing, but I'm, I'm just a weekend warrior like anybody else. We have a really awesome work schedule we're all 14 days a month a lot of our time off is during the week mm-hmm. we work long hours when we work but when we're off mm-hmm. we're off a while too 
But um, so I get to fish when nobody else is out. You mm-hmm. know, so we're out down there fun fishing during the week. There's no other pressure out there. And um, like I predicted to him early, I was like, it's going to take 18, 19 pounds to win this. Not for us. I'm just saying in general. Anybody, anybody for somebody to yeah, win, it's going to somebody's take, going to yeah. win this. They're going to need 18, 19 mm-hmm. pounds. And um, so I guess it was like three, three or four different trips I went down. And you got and, out. I didn't. I had just recently moved. And yeah. And I'm hard to get dragged away from the muskie. I was dragging out the muskie as long as I could before they spawned. <laughs> I'm, I still, uh, he, he loves them both, and I, I'm still one sided a little more than the other. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually do. They, they were my first three uh, smallmouth bass of the year that I caught. They was, yeah. it was a 19 and a 20. Wow. And um, they, I'm basically putting a new string on my, new, on my rods the night before. Haven't even <laughs> mm. jigged the tube or chucked a spinner bait yet or nothing mm-hmm. yet the whole year. And, I was kind of a little nervous on that, but we knocked the rust off pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, was, did, was that you knew the spot that you were going to go to? Did you have a backup plan? Like, what, what was your thought process going into the tournament then? Was it just one um, spot no matter what, or well, did you have A, B, and C? When you, I mean, most all my tournaments, for the most part, has been in that area of, of the river. So, there's usually two things everybody does everybody either runs to land or, or races to Harpers Ferry. Okay. Everybody's got to go above Knoxville, you know, so usually I'm the one to lag behind because I don't like driving by 50 spots to go to one spot. Mm-hmm. So I'm usually mm-hmm. the one that tries to see where everybody's going. And then as everybody keeps going by and I'll venture off my own way. So we sort of decoyed because we had a, we drew a, a low number. So we were one of the first boats out. Hmm. So me thinking a lot of boats are going to be coming behind us. I didn't want them to come and see where we were sitting at. Mm. It's just a spot I keep very secret. You know, hmm. I've, I've swore to him, you know, they don't, <laughs> we don't talk about this spot. Yeah, I've had to prep my finger <laughs> sign. <them>. Not for <laughs> you guys. Right. It was to some other people he fishes with and things like that, you know. Right. It's, it's a special spot. Now, are there boats around though when you go to this special spot? Like, because it is a small river. Or are you waiting for there not to be boats around so they see Well, you, I or? just didn't want to, you know, people know who I am. I know everybody there and they see me run right to a spot and shut down. Yeah. Bells go off. Like, oh, yeah. Why do you go right there? Okay. So you know, what kind of decoy stuff do you do? Do you like drive past it, wait for everyone else to leave? I just went off to the side okay. about 100 yards and started fishing some other little rock ledge. And then, you know, a tournament yeah. is. And everybody will go and they'll settle down at their honey hole, you know. Then about 10 minutes after launch, nobody's running. Everybody's fishing. And we just got on the troll motor, moved our way on over. And mm-hmm. Well, it was probably 10 minutes before we even put a fish in the boat. Yeah. So we're casting and casting. Just, nothing's just happening. Yeah. Nothing's happening the whole time. I'm thinking, well, he's about ready to karate, you know, karate chop me right now. <laughs> you know? I have faith in him. We always find, <laughs> he always finds a fish. And then um, one of us caught one. I can't remember. It was me. He was caught the first one, yeah. yeah. Was, and I remember it was... I didn't have to weigh it. I knew it was right there around four pounds. So we got it in the boat, you know, and I was like, yes, you know, at least it was, wasn't a, a wasted. To, that's a good way to start the day. It wasn't too. a wasted yeah. stop, you know. So what, what time of the day is it right now? We got four pounds in the boat. Are we talking like 10 o'clock, noonish? No. Oh, no. Shit. The tournament was eight to four, and Ooh, this, this four, was nine. probably, probably eight fifteen. Oh, okay. Wow. That's a great way to Maybe start eight, the day off. Then. Eight yeah. fifteen, eight twenty. Yeah. We put the first one in the boat, and, and just like a flurry instantly he was hooked up you know, wow and get the net and look back and you can just tell because with that current there they just mm-hmm. you know they don't want to come they're pulling with all they got mm-hmm. and so he got one in the boat and i believe that was another really good one it was high threes yeah that's the the, the 19 though she was skinny she was a little longer and skinny she was 19 and a half i believe right it was the third one was the the bigger one the the four six what she ended up being i think four five four six yeah the 20 incher and um so we end up catching Four fish over 18 inches really quick. And then we caught a buck. And we had, it was like probably 16 inches or something. Yeah, it's, yeah. It wasn't, it's been a little while in the live well. Mm-hmm. But we've moved around as there is a couple sides to this spot that sometimes they'll set set up too. So we moved over and was fishing them. They didn't get a bite. <clears> nothing happened. Moved back around. I remember we were on spot lock fishing that one section. I turned around and cast the other way. And sure enough, I got lucky and caught another one. Oh, and it was cool. an, another good one. I can't remember what it was, but it was upper threes. So, like, mm. instantly, here we are, our first mm. key spot. We're sitting on, without doing the math, it's right usually 16, yeah. 16, 16, 17 pounds. 17 pounds. Feeling like, good. And that was the best I've ever had come in the boat on the Potomac. You know, the tournament my father won, we only had 14-something Whoa. You know, all day. That's a change. <laughs> you know, so, to see, and it takes 
special timing, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm sure everybody, Jared knows, you know, it takes a lot of fish to mm-hmm. be four and five pounds. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is a special time of year during the spawn or leading up to the spawn. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. And not to mention the thunderstorms two days before mm-hmm. was the big key because it brought the water, the water up yep. and brought, put color in it. Yeah, I was going to say, too, it doesn't matter how good you feel because you can feel great about going in and have right. everything tied on, you think, and then you get out there and it just they're not eating and it's just not going well for yeah, you. And, you know, it's 11, 12 o'clock and you're still and maybe. We, got, we hit that dry spell. We was kind of struggling there for a while. I was like, I thought we uh, mm-hmm. did what we was going to do first thing mm-hmm. in the morning. Right. And it went an hour or two before then we just started picking them off one by one here and there again. And next mm-hmm. thing you know, we're calling – letting three threes and three fours go calling you know put another four two or mm-hmm. that's for three awesome. or nine back in the boat you know calling three pounders did you hear from the rest of the boaters did they kind of catch early too because i know that's always interesting to me too the is like whether the catches. timing is yeah. the, like some people you know, have that early bite some we, i was i was late getting up to the scale so i really didn't get to talk yeah, a whole lot to everybody and, and hear mm-hmm. how that went but it was a really amazing tournament for everyone because mm-hmm. i don't recall ever a tournament where you know, 15 of the 16 boats all had limits. Mm-hmm, wow. And there was four limits over 18 pounds. Wow. Yeah, yeah, two 19 pounds over yeah. several 16 wow. pounds. That's, that's tough. Remarkable. That's tough to have a 19 pound yeah. bag thinking, you know, we probably might, we got a good shot here. And yeah. then oh, yeah. you get trumped by 20 plus. Mm-hmm. Lunker was 5 1. The biggest one we called that yeah. day was 5 Lunker. 1. Wow. I mean, everybody's big fish was four pounds plus. Yeah. That's, that's cool. That's insane. It was yeah. an amazing day. I mean, it's, you could tell, like he said, he was. He drops me off. I go up there and to you know put the ball in the bucket and back the uh, trailer in there to get the boat out. And you you just tell there was a buzz. You know what I mean? Everybody was. Yeah. You knew. He's like, how'd you do? He's like, oh, we did good. Or they was kind of saying back out. Oh, I think we got 15, 16 pounds, and here they weigh a 19 pound bag. Mm. I'm like, dang, he sandbagged me pretty good on that one. So you know what I mean? <laughs> That's wow. <laughs> and of course, see how I did, how we did. I said, yeah, we back out the same and. You, know, mm-hmm. you could tell it was a, a, a different buzz going mm-hmm. on. And then once mm-hmm. I'm watching some of the fish get weighed in, I'm waiting in line to pull the boat down in the mm-hmm. getting, and I'm like, it's going to be a good one today. Mm-hmm. It's just some, you know, you see a guy pull a five pounder out of the bag weighing in, I'm like, mm-hmm. dang, you know. That's so, freaking, that's awesome. It everybody, really, said, everybody had limits, so I was like, this could be a, a tight one this, this tournament. It really honestly never set in that we were over 20 pounds. We didn't know when we came into the scales that mm-hmm. we had over 20 pounds. Mm-hmm. Math in my head, Oh yeah. I thought we were in that eight, high 18, mm-hmm. 19 pound mm-hmm. range. But where I lost track was like, what was it, maybe 15 minutes Did before weigh-in. Yeah. He, caught, he caught the biggest fish of the day. Is that right? Yeah. Because with the wind blowing... What really I heard it was the, the conditions weren't great. Really windy. Yes. How many mile an hour do you think it was? Oh, it was easily 25 oh, or 30. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's spot kicking. Yeah. The yeah. It was pretty that is kicking. And my trolling motor died by 1.30. Yeah. Seriously? It yeah, I had a tr- I have a charger issue, and um, I didn't even know it until that day. So we were struggling just floating banks, mm-hmm. just trying to keep the boat straight mm-hmm. while we were casting, you know, just burnt, you know, throwing spinner baits. And, mm-hmm. um, yes, yeah, that's how we really – we went up, so when we left that area and moved our way up river, we'd go up over Knoxville and move our way up in through there and start fishing and get to realize there was an absence of boats. I was like, where, you know, I know there's at least four or five boats up this way. Mm-hmm. And get to paying attention and we move farther and go above Weaverton and get into the Miller's area below 340 and there was one boat, you know, and um, we knew who it was. Um, Dustin McCombie. Oh, he's a good Nate, stick. And yeah, he's, he's a good stick. Both of fantastic yes. fishermen, yeah. Yep. So when you pull up in there and you see these two guys mm-hmm. have the whole river wide open to themselves, mm-hmm. I was like, well, we know they're sitting on a bag, mm-hmm. you know, because right. that's a heck of an area where they were at. Yeah. They were on a fantastic hole when we come up, you know. So we got to share that area with them a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then we ended up moving up above closer to Whitehorse and fished around and um, called a couple up there, but just didn't really happen. And we decided we were going to work our way back down to where we come from and um that's when chris actually come up with the idea to you know he's like you know we got a good bag let's maybe let's do something we wouldn't normally do and that's just cool. fan cast spinner baits in the wind you mm-hmm. know float down through these ledges and that's what we ended up doing you know we were above knoxville falls and pretty much from 340 to knoxville and we were just floating really focusing on the shenandoah influenced water because mm-hmm. it was a lot warmer Mm-hmm. It was probably what two, four to, two to three. Yeah, it was easily three degrees warmer, 
and um, we were definitely seeing them want to hit them spinner baits mm -hmm. over there. So it wasn't a steady bite, but I mean, we were catching them. And you were just yeah, floating just, with the current, whatever the current yeah, was taking. Yeah, sometimes just keeping it's a good the boat straight. Too, and, just to, yeah. Just yeah. one to Nettie, you see Nettie or Rock just trying to mm -hmm. pinball off those, like I said, fan casting those covering water. Mm -hmm. What was the temperature of the Potomac? Uh, just spitball. I believe it was 51. 50, 51, 52, I think we had a 50. Yeah, something like that. 50, 50 or 51, and then the San Andreas, like two to three degrees warmer. Okay. Wow. So it was right there, still below 55, but, you know. What was the flow rate like? You know, like was it was it pretty? Was I pre believe it was right around four foot. Four foot. At the point of rocks gauge. Okay. Yeah. But that came up, you know, almost probably a little over half a foot from the thunderstorms. Sure. And that was lead us back to when I was there pre-fishing for the two weeks before, it was really good. I ended up the first day in there, we caught a really nice 21 and three quarters, went just under five pounds, and a um, couple nice 19s and 18s. Wow. One of the ones we had in the well we caught that day, it had no um, upper mandible, was gone. We caught, really? caught mm. blunt nose. <laughs> it was an mm. ugly fish looking huh. straight on at it. But we ended up catching her the day of the tournament in the same spot. That's crazy. Yeah, and, um, Is that right? Yeah. Then she she ended up getting called out because she was skinny. Mm -hmm. She was heavy the day we the first time we called her. I think Jean might have called her, I believe. But then Chris called her and she was already skinny. How many days apart? Two weeks, easy. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, week and a half to two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I went back. Like I wasn't fishing it, but I had my buddy Jean with me, and we would just go over. The water was low and clear, and it was only two and a half, three feet deep. And I would just go in there on the trolling motor and look, because mm -hmm. you can see them in there scooting around. Mm -hmm. They were there for a reason, you know. Mm -hmm. I know they spawned there. A lot of people tell me it was too early, but it wasn't too early. There's certain spots where they spawn early. Right, mm -hmm. right. They were there for a reason, and that water dropped down, had that little cold front go through, and sort of just shoved them off a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. know where they went, but they must have just slid off. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess I was working the two days prior to the tournament, and then the thunderstorms hit us, and the creeks come up and got muddy. And that's what I told them. I was like, this just helped us. Yeah. I, I thought we were in trouble at that point, at least for that spot. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the water come up, and I knew then. When the water come up and it got some color to it, I knew then they were coming back. Mm -hmm. That spot will be hot <laughs> all the way through May now. Oh, they, wow. When they use it, they use it, and they keep using it. Like Ooh. the last time in 2008, I went back there several days and loaded up on them. But, That's um, nuts. What Very was cool. the water clarity like then when going into this with, with, with the water rising? Was the water rising during the tournament or the day before? I mean, did that chalk things up a little bit? Not really. Not really. The Shenandoah, I thought the Shenandoah water was a little cleaner. Right. It was. It just had like a, a little bit of a tea look to the Potomac okay. side, especially mm -hmm. the banks where the creeks had it a little stirred up. Mm -hmm. But on um, the center, it wasn't too terrible bad. But in the Shenandoah side, it was, I call it the Shenandoah side. <coughs> the water of Shenandoah influences below it mm -hmm. but um that was really nice looking water like i said when you see them spinner baits sparkle on the whole way to the boat <laughs> and it was beautiful for that's, that and then the wind cool. blowing with it mm -hmm. they were just crushing them but um hmm. that's a great bite too I was it started to be oh, a spinner yeah. bait i was talking the day yeah. about it and uh i mean they're like freight training and on the river i mean river four or five pound smallmouth i mean that's just you tend to that get is a blast fish too i think with them you know, blades bigger spinner yes. baits yeah. and stuff so mm -hmm. Everyone grab three baits that you think are a good thing for kids or, or people starting out to like catch this time of year. Uh, it doesn't have to be your juice, but just go grab what three baits each off the aisles and come on back. That'd be good. How's that yeah. sound? Cool. All righty, so we're going to be talking about baits next. So I guess, do you guys want to go like back and forth, or do you guys just want to all individually give up all the baits in front of you right now? Uh, how do you guys want to do it? Let me say, too, as we're doing this, Chris's yeah. son, Chris Jr., mm -hmm. here is shopping around the, the store. I mean, he's literally going up and down the aisle shopping and, <laughs> and like, like a pro. I yeah. mean, he's, like, he checking bait. He knows what he wants. And so we said so we had to bring him in because he, he, he likes a small mouth, but he prefers a large mouth. Using a bait caster, I mean, the kid's a champ. You can just tell he's he's a future fisherman. Not even a future. He's already a fisherman. He's, yeah. Probably outfished me right now. And so. with the power of editing, I'm going to show you right above me right here a picture of a fish that he just caught himself. Um, and, cool. dude, did you yeah. catch that big smallmouth all by yourself, or did you have help? No help. No help? No help. There you go. Yep. See, he's a Powerful. boss. He knows what's up. <laughs> What'd you catch that sucker on? I caught it on a, uh, a custom spinner bait. Uh, is it your personal color? Um... Uh, Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my sponsored product. Yeah. I like it. But yeah, the baits. Yeah, the baits. 
So who wants to go first? How do you want to do it? You want to go first, little man? What do you like throwing? I mean, you're on the you're you're on the front, man. No, you go, you go. Okay. What do you like? Why like you hit your large mouth on? Tell me how you like to catch a large mouth. I like catching my large mouth on sinkos, cause where I fish at, there's a lot of weeds, and you fish off of the edge. And this, we have different colors like. We have pink. We usually throw around pink because that's bubble what they gum. like. Bubble gum, yeah. And I was throwing, I was throwing around a swim bait, lunker nut, a lunker nut swim bait, and it was broke. I was about to change my bait. <laughs> my person, my personal best came out of the weeds and smacked that bait. That's Three awful. pounds and eight kilograms. Eight Dude. ounces. Eight yeah. ounces. I like, I like the units that you're using. Yeah. So uh, what what size uh, rod we're using? We're using a big rod, little rod, ultralight, uh, medium? Medium. Medium? Yeah. And that's Senko. How are you rigging your Senko? Like, what are you, where are you putting the hook? I How are you hooking this, it? I rig the Senko, like, right in the middle. Okay, wow. Kind of wacky style? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dude, that, that is a Good deadly stuff. way to fish that thing. And how do you how do you fish the swim bait you're talking about? The swim bait? Yeah, how do you work it? How do you slow that's like kind of like jerking it like it's kind of hurt mm -hmm. and it make it look like it's hurt yeah, yeah. even though twitch every once in a while straight real and twitching every once in a while that's a good way to do it that's a really yeah. good way to do it how long have you been fishing bait. around three four three years. years see i got pictures Dang. you in the snow <laughs> trout fishing pretty old <laughs> what's the biggest trout you've ever caught trout Trout was like this size. So at least 10 pounds. We'll put that right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That'd be the next thing. You'll stretch that thing out a little bit. And it begins. So, so, Chris, what are a couple of your baits that you think people should be throwing right now on the Upper Potomac? Oh, uh, Upper Potomac right now? Um, depending on the water clarity, I like the uh, jerk baits. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the white, the, the shadow wrap, the okay, slow sink. Hold that up right there I'm the sorry. Right there. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Um, especially when the water starts getting clear mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, you get that. Water temp, 40 degrees. I mean, you can still catch them 38, 39. You work it really, really slow. But it seems like 40 degrees is that magical number once it gets above that Okay. for the uh, jerk baits. Um, now it's starting to warm up. Um, spinners, I mean, it was, you know, what we did on a tournament. Um, any kind. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. We, have, we used to have different ones. Uh, they was Strike King that day. Um, yeah. It was... Um, Terminator. Help me out. The Terminator and the, and the sick ones and the Double J's. Double J's. He's yeah. a custom builder of an NPA. Makes really nice uh, spinner baits. I'm sorry. You had a trailer to those? A at all? A trailer to the spinner bait at all? Like a. Sometimes, not always. Mm -hmm. he, Rocky puts like a little grub on his a lot of times. Mm -hmm. That day I didn't have no trailer on, on mine. Okay. Um, the Terminator I was using had a long skirt, mm -hmm. so that kind of acted as right. a trailer. Yep. It had the bigger blades, the colored blades. It was white mm -hmm. blades. What do you like to throw that on? Um, what is your setup usually when you're throwing spinner baits? I just got set up with, it was a, a, bought a Kistler rod. It was the seven foot, it was medium heavy. Yep. And a new, uh, what was that new, the Kistler uh, bait caster reel. It was a six, six one or six, I can't remember the gear six ratio. Three? Six three gear ratio. Mm -hmm. that I just actually got, and it mm -hmm. seemed like a pretty nice setup. Okay. Handled it pretty well. And with jerk baits too, it was very versatile. Mm -hmm. You know, I can still throw a jerk bait on that same rod. Are you doing that on, on fluorocarbon monofilament? Like, what, what size line are you generally It's just straight mono. I mean, I, I use, um, I'm old school. I will use Strin or the um, mm -hmm. Berkeley a lot. I, you know, yeah. Berkeley power uh, yeah, line and stuff. Um, been moving up to the, uh, I can't think of the name of them now. He caught me off guard. Fluorocarbon? Yeah, fluorocarbon. Yeah, fluorocarbon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. well, that's cool too. Cause like Dad was talking the other day, like you look at all these lines we got over there, and people say, "Well, I want the best line." Well, what is the best line? Like, right. I mean, everybody's got their own, you know, Seaguar, mm -hmm. Red Label, the Yellow, like, you know, it's just so much out there. Right, and I it believe, is what you're comfortable with. Like yeah, Rocky, he'll do a lot of the leaders and, and, and you're the brave. catching four and five pound smallmouth in a river. Right, you know, so you know, it's kind of almost personal preference now. I shouldn't say that because some may be better than others, but my point is you're catching four and five pound smallmouth in a river system, you know, with, with good line. I mean, it's, I think it'll all work. Yeah, you know? yeah. absolutely. That's one yeah. of my favorite things about where Chris is at in his mm -hmm. fishing, mm -hmm. you know, because he doesn't 
get consumed mm. with the the technical mm. side of fishing mm. like i'll be fishing 20 pound mm. braid mm. and i have to have a 15 pound right invis x leader mm. you know for my jerk bait and he'll be like yeah i'm just throwing my 10 pound on mm. and yeah. he'll be fishing good, right though. with me if not out fishing <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's you know right. i'm just saying Sometimes you can clearly see they want his bait more mm. than mine, and we can be throwing the same jerk bait. Mm. Confidence, confidence, confidence. You know, yes. that. So, so Rocky, uh, you got a pile of baits in front of you. Like, you want to show off one to the camera? What is something that you think we should throw? This well, time um, here? I mean, on the Potomac, some of my favorite stuff. Um, I'm a little old school. I like the downsize. I love mm. jerk baits, X wraps, um, mega bass. But one of my favorite is the uh, X wrap number eight, size eight. Okay. It's the little guy, and um. I fish that on a sp on spin tackle. Mm. I, I like to use it with braid, you know, with a fluorocarbon leader, and it runs shallow. You know, we're in the river, and sometimes where I'm fishing, it might only be two and a half, three feet deep. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll just set and I'll I'll fish it almost like a tube, mm -hmm. you know. And I'll just mm. pop the rod tip a little bit. I don't fish it. Uh, I don't fish jerk baits aggressive. I like to give it a pop and then just let it do its thing out there. You know, they know it's there. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, they just load up on mm -hmm. it. That's the way I like to fit. I don't get up there and mm -hmm. go too crazy with them. I like to try to let them soak a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. You yeah. know, you see a lot of people, like, really aggressively working a jerk. I've never had any luck doing that on the river. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, a slow cadence mm -hmm. and letting it soak. But, um, yeah, X-Wraps is a good one to go with, especially for... The younger generation, you know, it's they're very buoyant. They don't sink right to the bottom. You get hung up less. You're you not know? dropping a hundred dollars per bait in case yeah. you lose one. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I know my first mega bass I just bought this year. It was really hard for me to to break down and drop that twenty nine dollars right. on a mega bass, but it's been worth it so far. They definitely catch mm -hmm. fish, and then you can't beat the the swim bait. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, K, -Tech, K Tech swim baits are really good. Um, Zoom swim baits, zoom flukes, mm. anything like that, especially for the young mm. guys coming in. It's easy stuff for them to learn how to use. Mm. I think this little guy seems to be advanced so far. I mean, mm. he how blows do you like me to away. Rig uh, your swim baits and your flukes. Do you have a specific way you like to rig them? I like I like fishing my swim baits. I like to swim them like a grub. Mm -hmm. I use a I pour a lot of my own lead, but um, just a regular um jig head style with mm -hmm. a, a barb. And um, I like to swim them. Sometimes on the Susquehanna, I jig them more. It seems like down home here, they like them swim baits swimming. And up there, they like it jig jigged. Mm. I don't know why. I'm, I'm just, mm. but they definitely seem to like stuff a little slower up there for me, mm -hmm. especially this time of year. And, um, now, when you say jig, you're talking about letting it fall down through the water column and then just kind of bringing it up just, and just kind of like yeah, just go go it. Almost like a tube. Yeah. 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 Almost like a tube. Yeah. And that is a good technique, too. And I've, you know, even lakes and stuff, just sometimes that, as it's falling down through the water column yeah. and it crosses them, I mean, they're, you know, on it and you're coming back up and they've, you know, yeah. already taken it. So it's a little different technique, but it's effective. <clears throat> um, same outfit as you're doing with a jerk bait, or are you going to be throwing that on a bait caster setup with, with your swim bait? Um, I usually only use bait casters for larger jerk baits, um, mm -hmm. crank baits and spinner baits, maybe mm -hmm. top water in the summer, you know, throwing a whopper plopper or something. More than that, I'm more I'm more so lean to the spin tackle side mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. What size swim baits? Because I know if you look at the Bassmasters, they tell you to throw like a 10 inch Huddleston. Like, are are you going more to like a two point? I guess what is it, two point eight size, like Kitex type of size? Like, is no, size this is actually small. I just didn't. I wanted to show the white because okay. white's a really good color on the river. But I like the four inch. Oh really? The four oh, inch wow. swim baits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three and a half. Four inch grubs like huh. the the um, Zoom Fat Albert grub. The four inch mm -hmm. one. I mean, they're all fantastic baits mm -hmm. on the river. Has swimming a grub gone out of fashion because of swim baits popping up? Because I remember Absolutely. growing up, that was the thing Al Linder said to do was swim a grub. I always laugh because my old fish, older fishing buddy Gene, he is the grub master in my eyes, and he's been <laughs> fishing grubs way before it got cool. Really? Like the Mr. And Twister, like the yellow Mr. Right, Twister. Right. Yeah. You know, all the way he used to buy Yama, big bag yeah. of Yamamoto straight mm -hmm. from Gary Yamamoto oh, cool. online. And um, mm -hmm. now I remember the first day he came, he's like, so let me get this right. We call a grub a swim bait now? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But it still works. Yeah, yeah. Still they do. It. Absolutely. Especially in the summertime. It's easy. Like yeah. one of his first trips we took him, that was, you know, 
hit first his first time river fish and everything and it, it's as easy you throw it out we're real straight yeah, in and that's right next you know he's hanging off the back of the boat like just jigging it and everything and yeah. screaming and yelling when he's hooking fish and that's so right. it was it was a good day <laughs> and it's just like little little white tubes yeah. little you know, chartreuse or smoke gray we, we switched back and forth that's freaking so, cool yeah and i guess before we switch uh switch segments uh Chris, you got another bait in front of you there? I think I see always talk about different. swim baits. This is one of my favorites. I use that uh, search bait, the 360. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's just got like a different wobble to it, different, different action. Mm-hmm. I found it was one of my first swim baits that I started really throwing and really started getting into it and had a couple really good days. So I always make sure I keep them a couple in my tackle box. The little subtle differences, like – the one day we was on the Susquehanna, they did want nothing to do with the straight ones. If they, if they didn't have the ribs, you know, huh. or vented, you know, they didn't they didn't touch it. I guess it was a certain vibration it was throwing off in the water. But if you like, say, if you was just throwing a streamlined straight swim bait, hmm. and I was throwing this or like the ones he's got the ribbed ones, yeah. that they was just hammering those. And they're so versatile too. Yeah. Like yeah. old man was saying, Chris was saying too junior i mean you can slow roll it in the whole water column yeah and then you can yeah. also let that thing kind of just drag along the bottom right. make it hung up more but the idea of you know f- feeding down you know slow roll it jig it swim it up in the column swim it fast swim it slow. i mean it's yeah, just burn it, throw yeah. it on the underspin too i mean there's just so it's many so things you can yeah, do with absolutely. it that, you know to catch fish so it i is think a, it's to a good dilemma now that we keep talking about like you have the, i see you have a chatterbait there you have a yeah bait. he picked that you he's he's big bait. into his chatterbait like, it's just like a spinnerbait it's easier to pick like, I mean, I oh, think that's yeah. interesting, like, because, like, back in the day when we didn't have a chatterbait or a swim mm-hmm. bait, it was easy. You'd probably be throwing a spinnerbait. Right. But now with all these different baits, like, generally, like, how do you guys decide which of those, because they're all excellent baits, but sometimes one just does outfish mm-hmm. the other. Is, is there specific things that you're looking at, broad term wise? I don't, I don't know how to make this any more simpler. Is it just jackhammers just how fish everything? They yeah. do. Yeah. I, swear I don't know what it is. I swear by I've them. seen it over and over again. I was really frugal about making that step towards jackhammers, too. Dude. And I learned yeah. that fishing with Jason Shea one day. Mm-hmm. He was just cleaning me up up on the Susquehanna one day. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you don't have any jackhammers? I'm like, no. He's like, so <laughs> well, I guess you'll be watching me catch them all day. <laughs> so how do you decide between, like, say, a jackhammer or spinnerbait, though, then? Like, to that point, how would you distinguish if you're going to throw a jackhammer versus a spinnerbait? Is there anything that... Any conditions or anything that says throw this over that? We usually you have a game plan. You know, you you got a good feeling that you know one or the other is going to catch fish, mm-hmm. or if not both. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the day and the mood of the fish change. Mm-hmm. But you know, a lot of times when we fish, we'll start off with something, and I'll start off with something different. different. We'll That's trying to, huge. Yeah. you know what I mean. You can't you can't there and both throw the same thing over and over and not mm-hmm. catch fish and expect results. Yeah, we you know? learned so that we, fish, we. Yeah. Yeah, constantly throwing something different. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to figure it out, mm-hmm. and then we bounce off and feed off each other. Once one starts mm-hmm. waxing them on something, you know what I mean, and then hey, that's what they're that's what they're on right now. Mm-hmm. So well, that's what you said earlier too. You, I mean, you talked about it. like you, Chris, you came up with a, an idea and then you went with it, and right. so I mean, that, you guys seem to make a good team, a mm-hmm. uh, good partnership with each other. Oh you yeah, respect each other. He's trust more each other, slow and other. technical. Like he, he teaches me mm-hmm. like to slow down. Like you pull up a spot just because you don't get bit mm-hmm. right away doesn't mm-hmm. mean they're there. Like mm-hmm. oh, he's more in tune to grind them out. Mm-hmm. Where I'm more like the um, more energetic, more running gun. Right? Mm-hmm. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Let's let's find the fish. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And sometimes that pays off, and sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. I think we. Balance each other out that yeah, way. Yeah, the nail on the head, like Jerry. Like a good team, and I think that answers the question about spinnerbait or shatterbaits. Like, will you throw both? Yeah, and you figure right. it out. I mean, yep. you know, I think you could probably get maybe if the water's dirty or something mm-hmm. like that. But generically speaking, if you have a team, you shouldn't be both mm-hmm. throwing the exact mm-hmm. same thing right. in the morning. Like, right. You're 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 killing the ability mm-hmm. to to break down water. That's I knew right. this when I fished college and stuff. If you fish a team event. If you're both fishing the same bait, you're going to lose. You mm-hmm. need to be throwing separate stuff because you mm-hmm. can break down that algorithm mm-hmm. faster and mm-hmm. figure out what works. Correct. Right. Um, but yeah, no, that, that that's really good stuff, guys. Folks will probably laugh at us on the water. I don't really see what goes on in other people's boats, but I'll have six spinning rods all rigged with something different, and four bait casters rigged with different stuff. And he's got, I don't even know what he's got back there. Yeah. We'll have 15, <laughs> right. 15 fishing rods in the boat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all scattered <laughs> through the boat. It's usually a train wreck when we do catch a fish. Somebody has to get the net or 
<laughs> right. Now, do you Tripping try to limit it rods. down, though, by tournament time? Are you one of those guys that, like, has 500 rods in their deck tournament day? Or best case scenario, do you want to get it down to, like, one rod each? Is like, are you, how, how do you like to approach it that way? With it's passion? getting worse every year. It seems like the number <laughs> grows. I, I first started out, I had, like, one or two rods, and I look yeah. in front of his boat, and he's got, like, six or seven strong out, and, like, yeah, I feel like they, uh, I'm underdressed or something at the prom, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, and it's like, like I said, it's... Um, but you can only throw one at a time. Yeah, you can yeah, only throw one at a time, but then yeah, it, yeah. it saves you time from tying hooks. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Search it through your tackle box, especially in a tournament. You know what I mean? You don't want to be sitting there tying hooks all day long. So you, first thing, you know, the night before, I'm one of everything, at least, you know, twos, maybe two different colors, right. two different styles, two, you know, sizes. Right, right. Jerk baits, color size-wise, spinner baits, you know, same thing, you know, mm -hmm. one of each, different size, style, color. Mm -hmm. Just to try to, you know, eliminate that mm -hmm. downtime of tying and mm -hmm. looking through the tackle box. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we already got our ideas what we like and you know, our smoking guns, mm -hmm. you know, what we always have success on early or, or before. So right. we start with that. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you end up going to something we never really throw that much before. Mm -hmm. So back to the rivers, you guys have dropped the Susquehanna River a couple times. And so. Talk a little bit about uh, the Susky and kind of where you like to go and and uh, your success up there on that river because we have again quite a few people from this area that will make that trip and Hagerstown you guys are probably only what an hour hour and fifteen minutes for you guys maybe a little more hour and a half yeah probably about an hour and twenty minutes <clears throat> to the closest yeah, spot there gotcha yeah um well I've been fishing up there like I said earlier since probably nineteen ninety nine. And before I got married, I probably spent 100 days a year up there. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, I was there all the time. Um, I'm not a big crowd fisherman, so mm -hmm. one of the things I wish I wouldn't have done now looking back, it was we found an area upriver, and um, it was up closer to Sunbury. Mm -hmm. It was between Liverpool and Sunbury, and um, we pretty much just went there every single time. Mm -hmm. Every You know, over the years... And just that's where we went all the time. I never went to Duncannon anymore. Or never mm -hmm. went to Fort Hunter. Them areas down below, there was so many more fishermen. I just I like getting away mm -hmm. from the back. But um, nowadays I've sort of come back down the river. I enjoy mm -hmm. experiencing different stuff. It's like up up in that region where I was spending all that time. It was grass beds and islands. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, down below you got a lot more rocks. Mm -hmm. You got a lot more um, tributaries influence in it, that's like right. um, Sherman's Creek. Um, the Juni, mm -hmm. you know, several creeks, mm -hmm. just to name a few. But um, it's really cool. You got so much more opportunities down there to work through the problems of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the wind's blowing, you got these tributaries to go into. Yeah. If the river's dirty, you got these tributaries to go into. If you don't like the current condition, just change sides of the river. It's probably dirty on one side That's and clean right. on the That's other. Yeah. It's amazing how that river right down the middle. Yes, it, it is. Yeah. Middle, it yeah. Be totally different. And um. I mean, one of the strongest things for me up there fishing is I have a, a really strong friend community up there. I have a resource of fishermen up there. I'm all, I, I pretty much know what's going on up there. Between the guys I work with, you know, Jason Shea and Pete Holmes, um, Matt Green, Mike Scholey, they keep me updated to other fishermen, other guides up there. Like, I always felt, you know, for me being the outsider from Maryland coming up there, they all treat me very well. That's pretty cool. I yeah. run into any of the other guys from other guy <laughs> trips. They talk to me at the ramps. That's cool. You know, I'll get messages once in a while or talk to them in creeks when we run into each other. You know, and that is such such a weapon to have a resource of people mm -hmm. that's there all the time and know what's mm -hmm. going on, whispering in your ear. Mm -hmm. Hey, you got any purple swim baits or hey, uh, you got any Tennessee shad mega bass? You know, there's, you know, there's always yeah. somebody whispering something, or the, the echo of the jackhammer. <laughs> what is the? Um, and, and you mentioned uh, off air that you do a little part time guiding right now, and and, uh, and I'm assuming it, on the Susquehanna, Susquehanna smallmouth solutions. Again, all this will be linked in the episode description, guys. Could you compare and contrast? Is the behavior of the smallmouth between the Susquehanna and Potomac Shenandoah is it different or is it the same? Do oh, they, absolutely is it different. Fish? different. Absolutely different. That's one of the hardest things. It's, um, you'll go up to Susquehanna and I'll be using bitsy tubes. I call hmm. them bitsy tubes, two and a half, two and three quarter inch tubes. And I'll be at Brunswick tomorrow fishing and I'll be fishing three and a half inch. Interesting. It's, hmm. yeah, and like Ned rigs are, are a strong bait on the Susquehanna and I do well on Ned's in the fall on the Potomac. 
but in the spring I've I haven't got on a Ned bike that I've been happy about yet. It seems like hmm. wasted time for me. Hmm. That's but, crazy. You know, when you're jigging, it seems like the tube down here and the big tubes, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Is like I talked to the Jason about this before. You know, prior to me starting musky fishing and before they started closing the seasons on the Susquehanna back to '99. I, that's all we fished with was large tubes, three and a half, four inch tubes. There used to be a, com a shop up in Chambersburg called Seas, and he had these huge tubes, mm. and we used to buy them by the hundred by bulk rate up there, and they would swell up and get enormous, and we'd just <laughs> catch fish on them like crazy. And now, if you throw a tube any bigger than two and three quarter inches, you're soaking baits all day. It feels mm. like. Mm. You know, it's weird. But. What are they eating? What's the difference? I'm assuming it's a forage difference that, that they're keying in on. Well, you know, once again, that's a, an opinion. Back then in them days, we used to see these huge crawfish parts. Mm -hmm. uh, you catch a small and it would spit up a claw, look like the size of a lobster. On the Potomac or on the yeah. Susquehanna? Yeah. Susquehanna? Okay. <clears throat> now when they spit up a crawfish, they're all little. Hmm. I don't know if there was that rusty crawfish that Chris Gorsuch was talking about. Yeah, the, yeah. there's yeah, a thing. difference in forward. Yeah. You know, the the crawfish, they're definitely, the large crawfish, I'll say, don't appear to be so dominant up there as what they used mm -hmm. to be. Okay. But um, but the smallmouth, too, though, I, I didn't mention last time, they're, they're like footballs up there. I yeah. mean, their backs are round and their bellies are round, and they literally look like a football. Yeah. <clears throat> even no. when they're not long, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not even long, the short one, I mean, they're just, they're football shaped. <laughs> So yeah. What's the forage difference then on the Potomac River? Is it not crayfish they're keying in on? Is it just a different size crayfish? I th I think it's probably the same. You know, as far as crawfish, the size of the crawfish I see are bigger hmm. on the Potomac. You know, you get the boat ramp, you'll see a normal large mm -hmm. one, looks like a creek one. The always part that throws me off is there are always these big orange ones. Mm -hmm. hmm. Maybe some green mixed mm -hmm. in there, so, so it makes me question my green pumpkin tube sometime, you know, because I don't feel like I'm matching the hatch, but they're eating it. Mm -hmm. And if I try to throw a tube that matches what I think's the hatch, what I've seen, I come up empty. Mm -hmm. So that's just a subject, subjective opinion on it. But um, there's definitely a difference between the two fish. They're... they're the, the waterways, they feed different. Their habits are different. It's like the water comes up on the Susquehanna, and you can catch fish on an island tail or along the banks. And the Potomac, the water comes up, you're on the bank. I've, I don't know a place on the river that they gravitate towards island tails on the Potomac. Mm -hmm. They're where I fish. I've tried hmm. mimicking it right. over yep. and over again. Mm. It's not very often. Interesting. I'm not saying you can't catch one fish on an island tail. I'm talking about like Susquehanna when you pull up mm -hmm. and catch seven or ten fish wow. on an island tail like you would on the Susquehanna. Well, and the Susquehanna's a bigger river, too. They got more places to go. Yeah. I mean, with right. Potomac, there's only so many island tails on the Potomac. True. So, how do they feed different? And like, in your opinion, you, both of you guys' opinions, how do they feed different on the Susquehanna compared to Potomac? Because that's really interesting. Because you think a smallmouth is a smallmouth, they're just going to feed the same no matter what. <clears throat> Well, my opinion on that has sort of changed since the introductory of the flathead. Really? I've found, it just, numbers are down. And obviously, quality's way up. We've talked about mm -hmm. that. You know, but these fish are just, what we have is so healthy now. You catch a 12-inch fish, and it has, even on the Potomac, it has the hump on its back. It has a belly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Any time of year you're down there, they have a belly. They're eating. Mm -hmm. So, maybe there's... Maybe there's ample forage for the smallmouth base we have now, and it's actually creating a better trophy hmm. atmosphere. Because I'll touch on this, but I'm not really the one to talk to mm -hmm. about it. Some conversations I've had with Josh Hanessi with the fisheries department. Um, I asked him because here earlier in the year, I was seeing a bunch of these 12 to 14 inch fish coming in the boat. Mm -hmm. A bunch of them. So I just asked him, hey, are, are these the stock, the stock fish, you know? And that's when he goes, well, it's funny you ask that. He's like, we, he said, we have proof that we have natural reproduction in the river since 2019. And which the, river are we speaking of? The Potomac. Of? Potomac, okay. And he said, we also have the ones that we've stopped. And he says, we're seeing rapid growth rates in both. That's awesome. Yeah. Interesting. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just following well, the pattern well, of my. What, what are your thoughts? This is this is a yeah, platform. Like, give your thoughts on what, what you think it is. Like, do you think it's um, 
when it when it comes to the flathead and everything, because I know everyone's like, oh, it's a hot topic. Well, I don't care. This is a flathead. Well, I don't like whatever them. they want. Like, I'll <laughs> say that straight up. I don't like the flatheads. I don't I don't like anything about them. I think they're ugly, but they teach their own. <laughs> they are fun to catch. Yeah. We he's you know, I've taken him out a few times, and the one you called was like 28 inches long. It took you about three hours to get him in. <laughs> and he's long. He's long as you. I mean, I, I do get the the big crave on them. They are aggressive catfish. They are, they are fun to catch. They do put a good fight. They are a good table fare. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not no expert in nothing. I did no, a little bit of reading and stuff on them. Uh, when I do read, I'm more of like a pictures and pop up person. But um, they they say that the uh, they they weed out the weaker strain of other fish. You know, they they prey. You know, just like on other predatory fish, the mm-hmm. weak. You know, whatever the slower genetic, whatever. So they, they it pr- improve, mm-hmm. improves the genetics. You know, yeah, the num- numbers might go down, but your quality of fish. Yeah. So they're thinning and, and out the smaller. This is what I've read on other waters that have flatheads in it. Yes, the numbers do go down a little bit, mm-hmm. but the quality of fish come up. I, mean, I thought about that too when you're talking earlier, and I don't know. There's probably not uh, like you, I was, you know, the opinion thing. I don't know if there. I don't have any data to back this up, but. You know, we talked before about fish kills, and I know it's been a while ago, but same thing with deer populations. You can't, you can't have a lot of numbers and a lot of big fish. Right. I mean, you might catch a you know yeah. big fish here and there, but mm-hmm. there's only so many groceries and food there. So if your numbers went down yeah. and we had the fish kills, and we're seeing this up Lake Holiday as well, like we, we had a small fish kill there last year, um, the last couple of years. And so, but the idea of if those fish that are still there and alive are the stronger and right. they're eating better, eating more, yes. There's more food. They're getting fatter. Well, and that's the thing we have Jason. So they're healthier. Remember? Mm-hmm. And Jason talked about that too. If you have a yeah. fish kill, it's yeah. the the forage gets to gets yeah. to explode, yeah. and then the cycle continues again. Yeah. That's right. right. And, and we're <clears> seeing those good years yeah. right now. And it's interesting too because I also talked about. I remember back in the again, I'm not gonna get these years right. I believe it was in either late '90s, early 2000s, maybe 2000. There was a time when both rivers were fishing really, really good. The Shando River went through a fish kill, and I can remember the Susquehanna was just on fire a couple years prior, mm-hmm. and then lo and behold, they hit a fish kill, and it just, I remember guys going up, and t- I remember telling them how great it was, and went up there, and it wasn't at all, and it's like, what the heck happened, but um, it just seemed, and I thought about this a lot too, and it seemed like West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, they all kind of like saw this, and now we're hearing the same thing now, Virginia. Maryland, you know, Pennsylvania, right. we're seeing it come back. So I just, I do believe in the, the whole idea of a cycle and it's going to come back you around. Totally. When I you mean, hear one of them struggling, mm-hmm. I, I start getting worried. Mm, right. But, but to your point about the cycle, I mean, and I want everyone's opinion here at the table. Do you think if there was supplemental aggressive or consistent supplemental stocking, of whether it's forage or, or smallmouth? by the state would that help these cycles not be so high and so low and piggybacking on that you mentioned early on back in early in this podcast uh, the maryland board brewed stock program so you all had a tournament that was put on so kind of yeah. go into more yeah. detail we went over that. Top of yeah. that, but, but it relates to what you're saying and then i hadn't heard this so maryland uh, yeah, that so tournament you guys won it was put on by the maryland state service. and walk us through yep. that it's actually put on by Wade Elwood and um, his club on behalf of the DNR, okay. and but the DNR supports it. You know, because mm-hmm. it's during the closed season, and um, hmm. you know the fish is there is afterwards to sort through them. But um, it started out as a five-year program. I believe they were telling me down there the other day that it was in its fourth year, hmm. but they've had a couple of struggles along the way. So it doesn't mean that next year is going to be it. This mm-hmm. is what I gather. It's the Sorry one year they canceled it because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And the first year that I thought they did it, they didn't have them. They didn't do a good spawn. What so there's a learning curve for them the first time. Wade or Josh? Wade. Josh. Wade or Wade. Wade. Yeah, Josh and this, he'd be a good one to talk to mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. He's, we got to get him on the show too. To talk yeah, about he'd be more. fantastic. But apologies for cutting you off, guys. No, no, it's okay. Continue. But um, so they had a couple rough years with it, but the intent of the the – tournament is for them to reap the fish take them to a warm water hatchery and spawn them in a safe environment let the fry grow to a safe size i don't not 100 percent sure what that is but i know they push back to like july time frame wow then bring them back to the river and distribute them between i believe it's edwards ferry to maybe williamsport i'll say that very interesting. Yeah. They do and, their um, shocking studies, and then they pick and choose areas, what areas they feel, you know, 
need to be, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. boosted a little bit with the size of fish they get with their shocking studies. Which that's mm-hmm. a lot like the, um, and you guys know if you've been following this podcast, I, I yeah, praise Texas Fishing Game for what they do. Where if you catch a ten pounder mm-hmm. and you call them, they'll make you a replica. They'll take that fish to their stocking program mm-hmm. and use it in the breeding program. Right. And this well, is yeah, kind of in the same line there. It's like just have the fishermen help and mm-hmm. let them bring them in, and we'll use this in the brood, mm-hmm. which is yeah. pretty smart. It's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. And they've done this with the walleye, correct, Rocky? In his previous. Yeah, it, and it, it, and it helped. Got to start from the walleye. Hmm. They had it really helped walleye. Really. Yeah, and um, they just I guess they come up with this plan to try with the smallmouth. The difference is apparently these smallmouth are really, really difficult to do the brood stopping. They are. Mm-hmm. You know, I know they've had a couple issues that I don't feel like I'm educated on it enough to talk about, but it was you know just shortcomings that they had to learn from, learning mm-hmm. curves. But um. I know they had a couple of successes with it. Mm-hmm. And um, this year, as far as this tournament goes, they were able to take 65 fish from it. Mm-hmm. And they went back out that same week and shocked up 25 males. To, I'm sorry, 12 males to put with them to send off to the warm water hatchery. And I'm here to tell you, I was there at the tournament seeing what they took. If the bigger fish always get credit for the best spawning, they ought to have some numbers that's awesome that's a yeah. that's a blowout i've never heard of this and that is awesome and you're right about the smallmouth because we stocked up at lake holiday and and john reedy spent he i bet he went through two three hundred hatcheries to find a smallmouth guy that raised smallmouth and it was out of ohio fenders because they say it is such a hard fish yeah. to raise or to to get to that point stocking point and so you're exactly right virginia i think is starting theirs back up here mm-hmm. uh, as well but that that's really good information. Yeah. I had never heard that, but it's it's a uh, plus the river. It's a great concept too, like you're saying, because you get a bad flood after they've laid the eggs, and you might as well forget, forget that age yeah. class. So they're they're mm-hmm. kind of yeah. um, and you're not getting them all either. I mean, there's still fish in there. They're going to naturally reproduce, like you're saying. And then now this is a way to introduce them. So that's interesting. Yeah. We'll have to look into that. Yeah, and especially because like you, you think about supplemental stocking on a river, like that's what probably needs it the most. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, it's not a lake where it's it's pretty much consistent in its water fluctuations. Mm-hmm. A river. We had Travis Eden on mm-hmm. um, once. He talked about like that that couple of years where you had the massive flooding and mm-hmm. it, it wiped them out. Yep. And if if we were able to supplement, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be able to help keep these fisheries to be as mm-hmm. good as they are, mm-hmm. you know, indefinitely. Which is, I think, what we all want is to have a good fishery around here. Yeah, and you guys are the end results. So, I mean, if you guys mm-hmm. are happy with them, you've been on. You guys have been you've been on the water a long time. So, if that's something you you can get behind and you're seeing Absolutely. good results I mean, of it, then man, that's awesome. Good for we're them. We're doing it for this little guy. Yeah, that's yeah. right. The future, happy. right there. Yeah, he gets that's older, it. you know. That smile. <laughs> <laughs> Not to keep going back to the tournament, but I mean, like. I'm, I don't remember too many times over my history mm-hmm. of fishing the river. You know, we caught eight fish over 18 inches that day. Mm-hmm. That's pretty amazing that's, that's, that's to awesome. do that on the that's Susquehanna. Really cool. That's right. Four or five of them are over 19. No, and, and yeah. you're right about that because it used to be where the Sus- Susquehanna was the powerhouse, and it still is, don't get yeah. me wrong, right. but the Shenandoah and the Potomac are putting out good quality mm-hmm. fish they as really well, are. which is good to see. Because I like it too. Like we talking about it, it kind of disperses everybody too. Right. It disperses your anglers. You don't feel like you have to go yep. to this body water to catch a quality fish. Well, and, right. and that's like because of all the hate mail you get on my channel when I threw this out. It's like if you think logically, if you only know there's one place to mm-hmm. fish, it'll mm-hmm. get more pressure than if there's ten in an area. Mm-hmm. It disperses the amount of anglers mm-hmm. you have. So Correct. if you want to decrease the pressure on your place, mm-hmm. you need to have other places just as good mm-hmm. because it will balance it out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so Absolutely. interesting where. If you don't know about the Shenandoah, I'm mm-hmm. gonna go to Susquehanna, and right. now we have ten boats in the Susquehanna. But mm-hmm. if you know the Potomac, Shenandoah, you know mm-hmm. the Conica Jig, uh, the Susquehanna, mm-hmm. if they're all good, it will disperse out the anglers, Correct. And, and that's what we really want because that'll also make the fisheries healthier. Believe right. it or not, if not one's getting pounded mm-hmm. for your straight. Mm-hmm. So no, that that's guys, that's really really good stuff. That's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Good. But yeah, so um, do we have anything else that we? Yeah, anything we else you guys want to share? Or throw out or? <laughs> No, no, this is pretty cool. Go I ahead. would say, like, again, I, I'm fascinated by the your, the guy that got you in is 89 years old, right? 79. 79. 79. 79. And then just the generations here uh, from 79 mm-hmm. right. to, I'm not going to ask your age. but oh, then 47. 47. That's how old I am. <laughs> how old 41. 41. Yep. So how old are you, young man? Nine? So, I mean, that's that's really cool. That's what I love about this industry, too, is you get take that from 79 <clears> to 9. <throat> okay yeah. and then and that's 
I don't want to say lineage, but it's a, it's yeah. a direct line of mentorship. Yeah. On down, and that to me, that, it's, and it's that's awesome. what it's all about. Because in in what you're doing too, and then talking about fish stocking stuff, and you're right, it's it's about the next. It's yeah, it's about for you. everybody, but the next generation want to make sure there's still fish in the waters for, mm-hmm. for them to catch as well. Because what's funny too, look at your smile on your face when you tell these <laughs> fish stories. But this guy right here too, I can guarantee that morning. Listen to him, how that set up. You mm-hmm. know the giddiness, like oh, I can just see yeah. in your eyes. Y- yep. Like he's like that morning. I bet you could barely sleep, or the night before you could barely sleep, and you I couldn't wait know. to Either get out there. Is, I knew so. what was going to happen. Yeah. I don't care if you're <laughs> nine or forty-seven. Yeah. It's just yeah. like yep. man, we're all like you get that tug on the other end, and that's it's it. like oh, on man. It's, yeah, yes, sir. That's cool. Oh, forgot. Like, so the same questions that we ask everybody, we answer one mm-hmm. of them about the stocking. But the other one is we we'll go around the table. Yeah, what is one goal you guys have for this year? And what is one piece of advice you give our young high school and our young anglers out there to make them better? So we just go around the table. Whoever wants to go first, feel free. Well, my goal is to get his young man his first musket this there year. That's uh, and to get him out there more, and uh, just yeah, just do it mm-hmm. and teach him. Just continue to watch him grow, and uh, and small matters. Just try to take him as much as I can. Awesome. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Rock. Um. I guess goal for myself is the um, elusive 50-inch musky. Okay. I'm always looking for one, you know. But mm-hmm. um, my heart lays with smallmouth, mm-hmm. you know. But I'm still after that 50-inch musky. But I'm not gonna waste too much time waiting for smallmouth when they're hitting good for that. Mm-hmm. But um, what was the record that? I'm sorry to cut you off. Was was something in the paper a while ago? 49 and a half. 49. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't 50. Okay. So you can still be the one to actually break that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well. Probably wouldn't say it on air, but them weights, <laughs> them weights are cute. But mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've we've had there's been quite a few musky in that river that's been caught this hole. It's probably pushing forty pounds. Mm-hmm. They just don't get turned in because you don't mm-hmm. want to exploit your area. Mm-hmm. So they're there, is what you're saying? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah they're there, mm-hmm. they're there. But um, I'd say we probably had two in the boat this year. It was thirty five to thirty seven pounds. Mm-hmm. But um. That's subjective. You'll probably get hate mail about that. But, yeah, well. <laughs> but um, I guess to to give advice to younger anglers, one of the probably the best fishing lessons of my life is um, it's two part. Try your best to respect everybody. It'll come back to you, and um, slow mm-hmm. down. Whatever you're doing, just mm-hmm. slow down. I like it. Don't yeah. let yourself get too far ahead. You know that was the. From all my time I've spent with my older buddy, you know, that was one thing. I was a runner and gunner, mm-hmm. you know, as a young man, and it took years for him to drive it into me to stop and smell the roses once mm-hmm. in a while, you know? Mm-hmm. you know. 20 years ago, I'd have never knew what a redheaded merganza was, mm-hmm. you know, or mm-hmm. stuff no. like that, you know, mm-hmm. stop to look at the eagles, you know, yeah. stuff that. like yeah. that. First high school tournament. Slow down and enjoy it a little yeah. bit because you're fishing for fun. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. awesome. Yeah, Frederick, uh, first high school term I did, and he said like that guy hasn't moved from that point, and you've already run around this like six times. Guess who's caught more? And that, that yeah. is so true. When you're younger, man, you throw that yeah. jerk bait like you have a shake weight in your hand. But mm-hmm. it's finding that balance when you get older to slow down, be mm-hmm. patient, and it that's really good advice. Mm-hmm. That's really good advice. But um, is there any uh, sponsors you guys would like to plug, or uh, Sus- I guess Susquehanna Smallmouth Solutions? Do you want to plug them at all? Yeah, sure. You know, if you're looking to get out on the Susquehanna River, you know, contact um, Susquehanna Smallmouth Solutions, and we'll try our best to get you out. Um, I also do some musky trips on the Potomac, and I'm always looking to do smallmouth trips on the Potomac. There's not really a lot of demand for it. You mm-hmm. know, if everybody wants to go to Susquehanna, but I love sharing the potomac smallmouth mm-hmm. people if they mm-hmm. want to do it just contact me that's awesome or contact us when smallmouth solutions and other than that you know um kissler rods you know they take good care of me and i use all their products and been mm-hmm. game changers for me that's awesome um, Undercover baits, undercover yeah, baits. Good guys. I'm no, I'm no sponsor, or none. I just fish. I just, <laughs> you know, I get hooked up and get to meet all these guys through him. And yeah, you know, I like the, the garage builders. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the small time mm-hmm. guys. You yeah. know what I mean? I rather would mm-hmm. buy stuff from them. And then, mm-hmm. musky know. tackle will be hot tail gliders. He's a yeah. good friend of ours. He's a garage bait out Anthony of Martinsburg, Ashby. West Virginia. He's hmm. put so many muskies in my boat and in my net. That's cool. It's unthinkable. Yeah. That's freaking. So no, that um, is cool. That's good to get that information out. Yeah. 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 Probably the most important, if you're going to play like we do, you want to have good gear. And then 
you know, being with Jason Shea, he was able to get me on with Sims, you know, Sims insulated challenger suit, man, that thing's money. Mm-hmm. It saved us at Muskie Tournament, because it was cold. Yeah, the big great Muskie Tournament really belongs to Sims. If it wouldn't have been for that suit, I'd have mm-hmm. probably froze to death. I mm-hmm. can't weekend. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for coming yeah, out. Yeah, we appreciate this you coming out. This has been a lot yeah. of fun. I learned, again, we say this how many times? We always yeah. learn something when we do this. And I'm so glad you started it because it is, you know, just to meet you guys. And, and it's different, you know, social media, you mm-hmm. know, we're friends on Facebook, you right. know, whatever. But you don't, like you're talking about circles. It's just to be able to broaden that, uh, the passion that we all share with fishing and to be able to meet you in person. And, and appreciate you coming on and sharing you know that passion because uh, a lot of guys won't and that's okay if they don't like you don't have to it's not yeah. about you know not, it's, it, it, each to their own but you know to come out and just you know share with the viewers and listeners and maybe they can take something you've talked about today and, and go mm-hmm. out and have success so uh, little man you got any, you want to shout out to your girlfriend or anything anything for mom <laughs> say I love you mom anything like that or no. No, all good. <laughs> I'm gonna, he's I'm ready, he's ready to go, pick, now. He's ready to go pick some baits out. Yeah, That's and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to, you know, I want to see these big pick, you know, these big fish you're catching now. Hopefully that musky, your first musky. So, but guys, if you'd like to be on the show, please reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, something like that. I'm insanely busy right now, but if you do reach mm-hmm. out, I will get back to you. Uh, you know, and we keep we keep teasing this thing, but we're going to have an announcement eventually. But it's so crazy, like no matter mm-hmm. like how much drama there is or how many political factions there are in fishing, we can all agree on the fish. And mm-hmm. every single guest we have on here talks about actually taking care of these rivers and waterways. And so I think we have something really exciting coming up down the pipe. We can't tell you yet officially, but we have something really cool fishing the DMV coming up. Mm-hmm. But again, please like and subscribe to the channel. Come by Jake's Bait and Tackle. All the baits that you saw here today are in stock. You can get them while they last. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.